Today we're talking about the top 10 things deep sea divers refuse to talk about. Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. And today we're reacting to a video titled The Top 10 Dark Things That Deep Sea Divers Refuse to Talk About. So we refuse to talk about these things. Wow. Or maybe we're not deep enough, deep sea divers enough. Like these are like really esoteric topics that we just... I have no oh, idea. Embarrassed we're, about or? we're about to check them out okay. and react. All right. But this is by a channel called, I think, Top 10. Like, that's the top, the name of the channel. That's all they do. Okay. And I don't think the person that put these together is a diver, which oh. is par for the course with these channels, as you know. If they're not a diver, then these could be 10 things that we, in fact, Talk no about problem talking about. <laughs> Correct. Okay, so we'll see. So let's give it a shot. I hope none of you folks had scuba diving on your bucket list because today's horror stories are going to deter you from ever doing that. Oh, oh. From decompression sickness to nitrogen narcosis. Let's talk about this and more only in today's video. We Top never... 10 dark things deep sea divers refuse to talk about. Starting off this countdown, we have the venomous sea snakes. One thing that divers have to look out for while diving are sea snakes, especially the venomous ones. Sea snakes have been known to come out of nowhere and just attack divers. In fact, these snakes are pretty deadly. Some species have enough venom to kill three people with one bite. Yikes. I, okay. I happen to know about this topic, Yeah. strangely enough. And I love talking about sea snakes. So she's wrong because I love talking about them. <laughs> and let me explain to her why. There is a region in Indonesia. Yes. I can't remember where it is, but it's somewhere I believe I saw them in the North Banda Sea area. And you dive with thousands of sea snakes. There's it's all over the mind place. mind-boggling. They're actually swimming in and out of your fins and they touch you. And what I learned there when I first was like, aren't these like the deadliest snake in the world? And oh my goodness, you're never supposed to be near them. And what they, and they were what they explained to me, the dive masters, is these snakes are in fact one of the most passive snakes in the world. But it is true that they are venomous. Or they're they're very ve venomous deadly and all of that. But they're they not just don't the, bite anyone. They're not the deadliest, but they're dead. You know, it's dangerous. So listen, yeah. this is what he told me. He said, look. It would take that snake fearing its life. Like you're going to almost have to kill this thing before this thing is willing to bite you. And it probably will not go through your wetsuit. Hmm. In fact, and I will say this was wrong. The dive master said, let me just show you something. And he put his hands out and he, he kind of held the snake. Yeah. The snake swam right into his hands. He's like, and he was like all around his face and everything. And this snake was just slithering around completely passive. Yep. Okay. There's actually so an episode. There. There's actually an episode of Jonathan Burt's Blue World, which I'll link to uh, here on the corner for everyone to watch afterwards, in which Jonathan Burt got criticized a lot because on the episode, he is holding the snakes and grabbing them and petting them and all of that. And yes, if they bite you, you die or whatever, but they don't bite you. Like, that's the thing. They don't do anything. They don't do anything. They're super passive, and they're actually quite beautiful to see swimming around in the water. And they're, uh, yeah, they're they're very passive. So yep. this is not a top 10 thing that scuba divers refuse to talk about. So one of them's gone. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Play. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I, I have control here. Well, let me share with you a diver's crazy encounter with one of these bad boys. So this diver went out diving the day before a hurricane. Well, while diving, a black and white venomous sea snake wrapped itself around his arm. Well, it turns out that these snakes do this before major storms. They sense the storm coming and they hitch a ride on things heading to the shore. So thankfully for this diver, the sea snake was only using him as an Uber, so it didn't have to exert itself. Thankfully, it didn't bite him. But still, that's pretty terrifying. Coming in at number nine, we have Yuri Lipsky, otherwise known as the man who filmed his own death. <laughs> On April 28th of 2000, Russian diving instructor Yuri Lipsky decided to dive the Blue Hole in Egypt. This area is a very dangerous place to dive, and a number of divers have lost their lives as a result. Little did Yuri know that he was going to be one of them. 
In the video, we see Yuri reach the bottom before his breathing slows down and the camera shuts off. Yuri descended too fast. He only had one air tank and he suffered from nitrogen narcosis. These mistakes cost him his life. It's just so disturbing how he literally filmed his own death. When his body was recovered, they noticed he was wearing a helmet camera. They were able to determine his cause of death by reviewing the footage. A bunch of divers know of the story, they just don't like talking about it. It's that disturbing. It's our most popular video. We did a whole video on this, and it is our single most popular video. And I think that we don't want to talk about a lot of negative things in general, right? It's not like a topic of conversation on a dive boat would be, hey, Gus, let's tell everybody about how Yuri died. I mean, but when you're analyzing, and in fact, these stories or these incidences end up teaching us a lot of things, right, about what not to do. And we absolutely did talk about it. So for those of you who haven't watched that video, go into our library and you'll find it there. I'm not going to cover it on this because yeah. we got a lot more to go. In our eighth spot, we have salt water aspiration. Another thing deep sea divers don't really talk about is salt water aspiration. Now, it is rare for it to happen, but it is pretty dangerous if it does happen. It happens when divers inhale a mist of seawater. This can be caused by faulty equipment or poor diving technique, and it can have damaging effects on their lungs. Some divers have had such bad reactions that it affects their breathing, making it very difficult. Some have actually drowned as a result in our seventh spot we have the well, great white shark i mean i don't know how how common this is it's right. like being it's like getting run over by a submarine you know like uh i don't we don't talk about that because it's not gonna happen but you did have an incident where you like inhale like a drop of water and you, you almost drown <laughs> i did i mean this was really deep i was like 300 feet it was in the cayman islands and I think what it was, I think I'm trying to remember, I think I bailed out for a second, and when I bailed out and purged the bailout regulator, it shot like a little pellet of water like into my throat, and I went, eh, and it sort of shut down my breathing for a second. It had nothing to do with saltwater aspiration. could have been any pellet of water, and I remember going like, eh, 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 and it finally opened back up. Yeah. But I so don't know if that. I, I've not heard of anybody ever having this saltwater aspiration, and- Seems no. like you'd have to have a lot of it. Yeah. So maybe you all know. Seems like a stretch. I agree. Ooh, great white sharks. I would love. While diving, you're literally going into the unknown. Who knows what's down there? Well, one individual was diving in South Australia when they encountered a great white shark. The shark was blocking this guy's way to safety. The shark was six meters in between the diver and the ladder to get out of the water. To make matters worse, the guy needed to get out ASAP because he was running out of air. But of course, he wasn't going to swim right next to a great white shark. Why not? I mean, neither would I. Thankfully, after a showdown, the shark ended up leaving the area. I bet that diver flew up that ladder. Man, I'd be climbing that thing so fast thinking that shark was going to come back and just rip my foot off. Jeez. In our sixth spot, we have... It gives, it gives them a bad rap. We've talked a ton about this before. There are areas, okay? This is what I will say. There are certain areas where... It is strongly suggested that you don't dive with the great white sharks. And in those are areas that typically they're feeding in. I mean, I can give you one example. Seal Island off of Cape Town. I went out there, and you do have to be in a cage. But that's because they're all over the place breaching for the seals. So could be some mistaken identity. What I don't like about this, and you've heard me say this before on these videos, is that it makes it seem like if you're in the water and a great white shark is anywhere near you, they're going to come swimming after you, Gus, and attack you. Yeah. Right? And is that, you know, come on. Absolutely you know. not. And I think, and we've had this question several times in the channel. It's like, you say sharks are not danger to divers. Why? Like, well, because they're not. I mean, it's, we're not a food source. This is not where divers is like eating all the time and, you know, they're desperate. So when a, they see a diver, it's like, oh, there you go, dinner. Like, we're not a food source. They don't care about us. That's actually one of the biggest facts about scuba diving. It's like sea creatures couldn't care less about divers. They just generally don't care. Uh, they're not danger. I would love to dive with great whites. It sounds awesome. Orcas, all kinds of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a misconception. Um, orcas is that other one. People are like, you guys are crazy diving with killer whales. There has never been a single 
case reported of a killer whale attack in the open, like for wild killer whales. There have been attacks like at SeaWorld and places like that, but never at, you know, in the wild. Orcas have never attacked a human ever, but they're called killer whales. So everybody's like, no way I'm diving with killer whales. They will be awesome to dive with. So except for it's cold. Yeah. All right, here we go. Safety line. Safety line. Imagine diving deep into a cave when all of a sudden your only Amen. source of light dies. <gasps> so you're just left there alone in the dark, cold waters, not sure which way is up or down. Well, this happened to two divers. They had only taken one flashlight between well, them, which was not smart at all. Shocker. As they started descending, the light died and they became disoriented. Lucky for them, they had a safety line that they could follow back to surface. However, they couldn't find it. So they were swimming around with no lights in the freezing cold water looking for this rope. The two divers began to swim back and forth using their hands and legs to feel for the rope. Still nothing. Eventually, by complete accident, one of the divers' feet hit the line. They were then able to use it to guide them back up. Turns out, instead of swimming back and forth, the two were actually swimming up and down, which is why they couldn't find the rope. I can't imagine how scared they must have been, like swimming around looking for their means to escape. It's pretty terrifying. We are now at our fifth and well, halfway mark with- Look, <clears throat> she's not really that wrong. I mean, if you go into a cave, which is what she said, and you only single light goes out and you have no line, you would be quite nervous. She's, that's what she said. But the funny part is but, how she started the whole thing. Imagine you go inside a cave and your light dies. Like, yeah, I mean, that's the what? issue. But that's the point of cave dying. I know, but look, she's not really doing anything <laughs> terrible here. She doesn't know. That's what right. I'm telling you. She just is like, look. I would be very scared if I went into a cave and my only light went out and now I'm in pitch black and I can't find my way out. So would I. I would be very nervous at that point. But we don't do that. Right. The point that we're trying to bring out to you in the, in, the, in the world, in the diving public is we don't do this. That's why we dive with three lights each. That's all. That's all I'm trying to put out there is that we don't do what she's saying right. happens. It's just not done. Imagine you go in the shower and open it up and water hits you in the face. You're being yeah. rough on her, but I get it. That's she's being, what happened. She's only expressing what her fear is, and I, I, I get that. But I just right. want you to know that it's really not a fear not that a we should case. have because we don't die with one light in a cave. Right. With the bends. This is one of the worst things that can happen to you when you're out deep sea diving. It's called decompression sickness or the bends. It happens when scuba divers ascend too quickly. Basically, divers breathe compressed air that contains nitrogen. When they ascend too quickly, the nitrogen forms bubbles in the body. These bubbles can turn your blood to foam, they can cause yep. irreversible tissue and nerve damage, mm -hmm. and they can even paralyze you. Nobody talks about just how serious getting the bends can be. And our <laughs> okay, all right, hold on one second. <laughs> we we talk up. about it all on your first time. ever it's scuba class. All like, the time. We talk about, yes, the dangers of you know coming up too quick um and developing bubbles you know she was wrong in a technicality you develop bubbles at all times it's not when you come up uh that's not what happens your bubbles are going into your system or nitrogen is going into your system the whole dive um but without making it too technical you know the deeper you go the easier or the more nitrogen goes into your body so if you come up too quick those bubbles will expand and cause what is known as the compression sickness. Now, the compression sickness is unpredictable, which is what she said, and she actually did a good job with this, uh, when she said it can cause paralysis, death, like, that is true. But it's called the bends because m the most common way to tell that you have a little bit of the compression sickness is that in the parts of your body, the bend, like your elbows and your knees and stuff like that, they get itchy. The, the bubbles tend to accumulate on the parts of your body that bends. That's why they call it the bends. Right. Um, so for the most part, you can feel that and you're not going to go paralyzed. And we talked about this on the first ever scuba diving class, which is open water diving. Yeah, yeah I'm a little confused right now by the title of the video, like you said, because it's, <laughs> she's bringing up items that we have to deal with and be mindful of as scuba divers, but not items that we are never willing to talk about. Right. So that's a little bit weird of a title. 
Hey, Woody, can we talk about the Bents? No. <laughs> you can't. That's very funny. I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> My nope. lips are sealed. We will not. Made a vow not to talk about the Bents. Hey, sir, instructor. I, heard, I I saw on YouTube a video about the Benz. What is that? <laughs> Never say that word again. Okay. Fourth spot, we have the bad air. This is another the very dangerous thing that can happen to divers, and that's having their air supply go bad. This story comes from an experienced diver. While he was 18 meters down, his air went bad. He knew because it started to have a weird, metallic y, sugary taste to it. After a few puffs, he fell completely unconscious. Thankfully, he was rescued just before he drowned. Sadly, the man did rupture both his eardrums and lost his hearing in both ears. He hasn't been able to dive since. Now look, I'm gonna tell you what I th think she means, but you go first. Yeah, well, no, I was I was gonna Looks say like that. A rebreather, I'm just saying. I was gonna say that this is a thing, um, you know, and and we actually covered this. We don't refuse to talk about it. We cover this in class. You know, one of the things that we teach you when you assemble your gear for the first time is to smell the air that is coming out of your regulator before you start breathing it. You put it against your nose, you press the perch button basically on the regulator, which allows air to flow, and you smell it to see. We tell you if it smells like smoke, if it smells like diesel, if it smells like anything other than clean air, you do not use the tank. That's one of the things that we tell you. So the fact that we do that exercise is because we know that in some cases, Right? You can be in the middle of nowhere, in Central America, whatever, where the compressors might not be maintained as much as they should, and some of that can get into a tank. And actually, on the book Close Calls, Mike Young tells the story of this thing happening to him in Mexico, where it was, I mean, people think that the stories we've had of Mike in the channel have been gnarly. The one in the book is insanity. Um, so Mike had a very, very 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 close call that i would have died i think if that happened to me mike survived because he's superhuman i feel like um but it had to do with bad air so it is true but it doesn't develop over time it's not like she made it sound like this guy was diving at 18 meters and all of a sudden the air was bad no he went in with bad air to begin with and then he had a problem yeah well, i mean well said i mean the only other thing i thought that may have happened from what she showed in the video, it looked like somebody was on a rebreather. Mm. And the incident that she may be referring to was actually somebody that did end up getting, hitting bad air during a rebreather malfunction, namely a CO2 breakthrough. That's all I can think of if it, because that, I, I mean, the incident video that she quickly showed was somebody on a rebreather. Again, on a rebreather, we have to send our air back through a CO2 scrubber to clean the CO2. If that fails, that air could go bad, as she said, and could cause the symptoms that she is alluding to. Yep. Moving on to number three, we have the goggles. Losing your oh, diving man. gear or having it malfunction can be a very serious issue. In certain cases, it has led to death. While a couple of years ago, this novice diver almost passed away after having his goggles snap off his face and float away. He was then left 50 feet underwater without vision. He started to panic, which obviously is like the worst thing to do, and he almost passed out. Thankfully, his dive instructor heard him and gave him an extra pair of goggles. The dude then calmed down and was able to continue on with the dive. Okay, I could see how that would be terrifying, especially since this was his first time diving. Coming in at number... Is all I will add to this is that a skill that we do... Let me count it. One, two, three, four... And then three more, five, six, I think seven or eight times in the SSI class. I think it's eight, actually. We do this skill eight times where we're basically putting water in a mask in one form or another and clearing it. Some's a partial, some is a full. Sometimes you take it all the way off. Like eight times we do that skill. So if it floods, we deal with that. If you lose your mask altogether, like drop your mask, it's gone. Then we also do a skill where your buddy grabs you and swims you and would take over control for you, which is why we don't want to dive typically more than three seconds away from a buddy. I mean, you would be looking around just either giving out of air or, 
you know, waving or something and somebody would see you like, I, I got no mask. And then that's how we deal with that problem. And we do practice that skill as well. By the way, these are in your very first open water class. These Absolutely. aren't even in advanced classes where we deal with these. So I just want to put it in perspective. Yeah, you can totally breathe without a mask. You know, I at the beginning, she said, oh, there's been a case where somebody drowned because of it. I mean, we do this so many times on the open water class that by the end of it, you should be super comfortable at breathing without a mask. It's not going to be as easy as breathing with a mask, obviously, because the mask helps you see and that's better. But it, you should be able to breathe without a mask, no problem. And that's when what you talked about, um, the no mask swim and stuff like that would help. Or your body will just take you up if it's, if it's like a void, like maybe the visibility is not good and you you know your mask dropped for some reason, somebody kicked you in the face by mistake or whatever, and your mask is gone, then you with your body, you will link up and go up. I mean, there, you can breathe through the regulator without a mask. It's not a life or death situation. The best thing I think out of that whole thing is carry a spare mask, not goggles. I'm not going to, that's the whole thing. You know, I'm not going to go into, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about because she called it goggles. Uh, obviously don't call them goggles, they're masks, but it's not a life or death situation. Carry a spare one. We carry a spare mask in every dive that we do. And um, yeah, and you deal with it. It's not that big of a deal. Two, we have nitrogen narcosis. When you're diving, you're inhaling compressed Reduce. air from an oxygen tank being under pressure from the water. This increases the pressure of oxygen and nitrogen in your blood, and that pressure affects your nervous system. When divers swim past 100 feet, they will be inhaling the gases at a higher partial pressure, and that's when nitrogen narcosis can set in. The thing is, it can make the diver feel happy, like they're drunk. Nitrogen narcosis causes disorientation, euphoria, hallucinations hallucinations and poor judgment upon other things. So the diver could literally be dying and they'd be like, "Wee, let's dive down deeper. It's very dangerous. And in our number one spot today, we have Martin Robson. All right. So before she goes into Martin Robson, um, we talk about nitrogen narcosis all the time as well. Class That's why I day, don't understand. day one, day one open water class. Right. I don't understand why actually before, because you're doing your online stuff on your online materials before you go to your first class, you're learning about nitrogen narcosis. Um, I'm not sure why is it on on you know things that we refuse to talk about. We talk about it all the time, but it is true. I think that you know the whole nitrogen narcosis thing. To me, the danger is not so much that you're gonna do something stupid because you're happy and you're like, "Wee, let's dive deeper." I don't think that's that's so much uh, of a danger as it is that you will be very slow to react and make good decisions if you have a problem. That is really when nitrogen narcosis is a danger, right? It's not that you're going to be like, oh, this is awesome. Let's just go dive deeper or let's just breathe water. Although that can happen in like severe cases. I remember Jacques Cousteau talking about how he thought he can, you know, breathe water and talk to the fish because he was severely narc diving at like 330 feet on air. But he... Right, but you can talk to fish, though. All right, that well, that's, part, and I'm not narked. I'm just saying we that's know another that. thing. But anyway, the point with nitrogen narcosis is just like you can be, you know, she um, she mentioned like being drunk. Um, you know, if you're drunk and everything is okay, that's fine. But if it's a life or death situation, like the whole place where you are is on fire and you have to try to figure out a way to put the fire out or to escape, and you're completely drunk. Chances are you're going to die because your decision-making skills or the ability to move and all of that are going to be impacted, right? That's nitrogen narcosis. While the dive is going great, probably nothing's going to happen. The problem is if there's a problem, if somebody's out of air, if you lose your mask, like we just talked about, stuff like that, now you have to deal with nitrogen narcosis on top of the other problem that you're having. That's when it's dangerous. By the way, she gave a very good explanation of nitrogen she narcosis. That, right? Yeah. I mean, did a great job. So... She Deeper certainly talks. She, she certainly talks about it, yeah, very well. And I take back the goggles thing. She would, you know. No, I'm just saying that giving her back it's not points. a topic we don't talk about. Uh, <laughs> we talk about it all the time, and she talked about it very well. Yeah, that's my only comment. Job. This right, has got Robson. to be one of the scariest stories about a diver getting the bends. In the winter of 2012, a man named Martin Robson took part in a multinational expedition. Part of the expedition was to search the waters of Blue Lake, Russia to find this underwater cave system. Everything was going well for the team and Martin until the last day of the expedition. Martin decided decided to dive more than 700 feet down in the lake. This was deeper than anyone had gone before. As he returned and was only 75 feet down, he got the bends. 
Nitrogen bubbles got into his spine and exploded. He became paralyzed in his legs in an instant. Thankfully, his team was close by and rescued him. But to this day, Martin can no longer dive and is fully paralyzed from the waist down. All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments. So yeah, that's pretty much the end of the video. But it is it is important again to know that the the unpredictability. I don't even know if I said that right. I don't think so. Uh, how unpredictable <laughs> it is when these bubbles form. They can go and sit anywhere, right? They can paralyze you like it happened to Martin Robson. And I'm not familiar with this story. Um, the problem with these stories, and this happens also with the Sheck Exley story, when people call us out for not saying that cave diving is super dangerous and that the person who wrote the book about cave diving, which was Sheck Exley, died diving, uh, cave diving specifically, we should say that and make sure people understand that it's super dangerous. The truth is that a lot of these deaths are in extreme situations. Like you can see this guy get paralyzed diving on a lake at 700 feet. Like when you do your deep diving class for recreational divers, you do your deep, deep diving class, you're certified to dive down to 130 feet. This guy was at 700, all right? So this is like saying that, you know, cars are dangerous because somebody died trying to set the land speed record, right, for, uh, for a car. It's like, okay, yeah, that guy crashed or his car failed while he was going at a thousand miles an hour. Of course he died. That doesn't mean that you, you know, driving around to go to the grocery store, you're going to die if your car fails. Like you will probably have a failure and pull over to the side and that's it. Like it's happened to many of us. I blew up a tire in the highway. I, you know, a lot of people have situations like that. Same thing happened to Sheck Exley. He, he died at like 800 feet. So yes, of course, those guys died is undeniable. But they were doing dives that no regular cave divers are doing. They were doing extreme dives. And that was the reason why they died. Not because they were cave diving, right? And I think Dog had a really good explanation for this. He said that if somebody has a heart attack playing golf, they wouldn't call it a golf dead or a golfing dead. But if somebody has a heart attack inside a cave, they would say they died cave diving, right? It's, it's unfair that you can be doing an activity and that death would never be assigned to it, but with cave diving, you are, right? Um, so yeah, these deaths are tragic, but the sport is not necessarily super dangerous just because these guys doing these world record dives had an accident and died because of it. This guy, this guy didn't die. Um, yeah, but you know what? Cave diving is dangerous, mm -hmm. everybody. So you can save when all your comments, trained. okay? Cave diving is dangerous. You don't have to put a comment and, and argue with us about it because we agree. It's, it can be very dangerous. Anybody that enters those caves without what is the hardest class scuba class that I've ever taken, it's unbelievably dangerous. That's so right. no argument with that. Just it's not that dangerous if you're properly trained and follow the procedures. That's, That's right. all my comment would end with. That's right. Uh, but that was it. So that is the top 10 things that we allegedly refuse to talk about. From now on, if you ask me about <laughs> any of those things, you may say, see, or I'll say. Can't talk about it. Like, I'm not even going to open my mouth. I'm just going to be like. Yep. Okay. Do you bring, up, do you bring a spare mask? Wait, wait. Did you just say great? I'll say. <laughs> what? You said great. Oh. You know what? I, I, I say that you shouldn't Humber talk on. about goggles. Do you, if you bring goggles, never. you should talk. be kicked out of the I will, I will never talk bubble. about goggles. <laughs> uh, but other than that, of course, this list was put together by someone who's not a diver. We're used to these videos. And actually, I think later on on the video when she's talking about, you know, um, please follow me and all of that, she talks about how she wants to learn how to dive. But, you know, stories like this scare her and she doesn't want to go diving. And well, I, you know. I say, go diving. Absolutely. Learn. I'd love to certify her. But we're about to teach a class together soon. And um, yes. since now I'm going to never talk about these things, it's kind of how are we going to talk about the no masks? No, no masks. Yeah. We're we're, gonna what are we going to do? <laughs> so I, I don't know how are we going to do it? We're, we're, we can't talk about that. Divers Absolutely. refuse to talk. It's kind of funny. But I get it. She did her job here. She's just trying to get yeah. attention to these items. So. 
All right, Absolutely. Everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you enjoyed it as well. And uh, keep sending us recommendations, right? Another thing is we've noticed a lot of people buying the merch and sending us yes, pictures. Thank you. We love that. Shopdivetalk.com is the website. Uh, check that out. We have a lot of items in there. Um, and, yeah, we, uh, we really enjoyed reacting to no, the yeah. videos that you guys are once, sending us. Once we explode a jet ski, we'll probably have oh, a shirt with that, a, a photo of that. Would be a cool photo with the fire and all that coming out as it, it. So we need to make sure we have the cameras on it right during the explosion time. That's I thought I would wrap it up, reminding right. Gus of that. So thank, thank you, you everyone for tuning in, and I uh, will see you on the next one. Bye everybody.